On the Mayflower, Voyage of the Ship's Apprentice and a Passenger Girl, written by Kate Waters with photographs by Russ Kendall. Prologue. On September 6th, 1620, the ship Mayflower left England and sailed into the open Atlantic Ocean. The ship's destination was the northern parts of Virginia, near the mouth of the Hudson River. On board were the ship's master, Christopher Jones, about 30 officers and sailors, 102 passengers, and the ship's apprentice, William Small. Only two people on board had ever seen the land they were sailing to. By God's grace, my name is William Small, but I am called Will. I am apprentice to Christopher Jones, master of the ship Mayflower. I am learning to read maps and charts, to find our ship's position by the sun and stars, and to know the weather. This is my second voyage. I have never before been across the sea. Truth be told, I am fair excited and a bit afraid. As we leave Plymouth Harbor in England, I watch the sailors unfurl and set the sails. The bosun calls out the orders. All hands, ready to set sail. Courses in their gear. Heave on the mizzen, halyard. Stand by to loose the fore course sheets. I am not yet tall enough to climb the rigging, so I help belay the lines. The lines are awkward and sticky with tar. I look back at the land and think of my family. I wonder when I will see them again. Once at sea, Master Jones teaches me to measure the position of the sun and the horizon with a quadrant. It is hard to hold the quadrant steady as the ship pitches and rolls on the waves. My knees will ache mightily until I get accustomed to the motion again. In the roundhouse, we compare the readings to the charts, and Master Jones sets our course for North America. At night, when the winds die down, the motion settles somewhat. Now I hear the passengers in the tween decks. They sing and pray with good voice. I can smell their food and hear their children squeal and run about. When I fetch the master's meal of oatmeal and peas and pork, John Reynolds, the cook, grumbles about the praying and the chatter. I serve Master Jones, John Clark, the pilot, and William Hall, the bosun. They are in good spirits now that we are under sail. After our meal, John Clark begins my lessons on the traverse board, which we use to mark the ship's direction and speed. On my way to my bed, I peek down through the hatch. The master would not like me spying, but the people below are a curiosity to me. Tis a small space for a 102 people and their belongings. I can hear the passengers complaining about the close quarters and the pitching of the ship. I am grateful to be up here where there is room to walk about. The days continue fair, and the passengers seem used to being at sea. First thing of a morning, I haul seawater to wet the boards to keep them tight. A passenger girl comes on deck to empty a chamber pot. Though I should not linger, I am bold to address her. She says she is called Ellen Moore and is traveling without her parents. How do you keep your days below? I ask. "'Tis mostly tiresome,' she answers. "'There is so little space and so many people. "'But I am kept busy. "'I pit prunes to help with the cooking. "'I mend garments. "'I pass the time plain. "'I wet cloths for those with seasickness. "'And I wonder about this place, North America. "'We have prosperous winds.' and Ellen and I converse often. Then, over half the seas crossed, the winds begin to blow mightily, and it gets fearsome cold. One morning, I hear the master's whistle summoning me to the roundhouse. A storm is coming, Yonker, he shouts. Be quick. Tis likely to be rough since it is autumn. We must mark our course well. He gives everyone their orders. 
The sailors clew up and furl the sails against approaching wind. There will be no steering the ship during the storm. We will drift in the hands of God. I call for Ellen and give her the master's orders. Douse your cooking fire and all lanterns. A single spark could set the ship afire. Secure all that is likely to roll about. The hatch will be covered until the waves calm. Be brave. When night falls, the winds blow more fiercely. The sea roars enough to make me deaf. The waves throw water everywhere. Shivering in my hammock, I hear the sailors running to and fro and the mates shouting orders above the wind. I think of the passengers below in the darkness and cold. No one will have time for their concerns until the danger to the ship is past. There are days and nights of fearful dark and wind and rain. I am kept more busy than before. I help the gunner relash the cannon that has loosened during the night. I pour drink for the tired sailors and listen to their talk. Some fear the ship is not sufficient to withstand the storm. One day, when the storm seems less hard, I uncover the hatch and call Ellen. She comes on deck and gulps the cold, damp air. You are fortunate to be up here in the wind, she tells me. Tis so close and rank below, and tis cruel with only cold food. Everyone suffers from seasickness, and I am kept busy tending them. I worry so for Mrs. Hopkins, who is large with child and cannot find a way to rest. The storm does not relent. One howling day, the carpenter rouses me. Quick, lad, we've leaks to fix. Every man must help. My stomach drops at this dire news. I carry the carpenter's caulking mallets, irons, and the oakum and climb down into the hold. Black, rank water wets my shoes. We caulk the leaks and more open up. It seems to take hours upon hours. It is hard to hammer true with the ship rocking as she is. When we finally climb above, I pass the passengers' quarters. There is a mighty stench, and many look fair pale. Ellen has said her people pray through all the hardships and believe God will take them safely to the new land. Despite the storm, they try to make a home on this rough ship. I hope their prayers will keep us all safe. I nod to Ellen, but I cannot linger. In a fortnight, the skies begin to clear. On my way across the deck, I see the hatch open a bit. Ellen peeks out and starts when she sees me. Will, she whispers, is it over? Are we safe? Mrs. Hopkins had her baby three days ago. I don't think we can bear any more. Twill be calm now, pray God, I answer. The master will give you leave to be on deck as soon as he is sure. When the passengers come up to get air, Mrs. Hopkins shows me her baby. He is named Oceanus after the sea. <laughs> what a tiny creature to ride out such a storm. I mend a sail while Ellen tells the news. I tell her about the fearsome days and nights of the storm and the constant tasks and errands I had to do. "'Twas just as bad below, she says. Some said they'd leaf die then suffer through one more day of such rocking. But our prayers were answered. Then, on that day, we hear goals. Goals mean land is near. But by our bearings, we are bound for the land called Cape Cod, not Virginia, when the passengers have a patent to settle. The storm has taken us off our course. After a day of trying to sail south, past the perilous shoals of Cape Cod, the master meets with the passengers. They agree to try to find safe harbor there, since winter is upon us. The next day, I see leaves and branches floating in the water. 
It has been sixty-five days since we departed from England. Suddenly, there is a cry from the working tops: "Land ho!" We anchor in a protected harbor, and the passengers set about exploring the land. During the months that the passengers build their houses in this cold place, the ship is still their home. Ellen is given leave to come on deck more often, and I have fewer chores to do. We teach each other songs and tell stories of our lives at home, but mostly we talk about the hardship of the voyage. I can survive anything now, Ellen tells me. Indeed, you are brave, I tell her. With their houses built, the last passengers leave the ship. As the Mayflower sets sail for England, I feel sad, for I will miss Ellen. She has been my family in these days. Looking back on the land, I can see the roofs of dwellings and the smoke from cooking fires. I wonder if I shall see Ellen again. May God grant you well in this new land, my friend. The end. This read aloud has been brought to you by Time to Read to Us. Hit the subscribe button for more kid-friendly read alouds. Thanks for watching.